hello everyone uh welcome uh good morning good afternoon good evening um depending on where you are viewing this program in the world um i getting a little bit of sound i'm just uh, if folks who are viewing uh the session if you could mute yourself that would be appreciated um again hello everyone and welcome uh to uh this session um i'm lisa dolberry hancock and i'm a graduate of the School of International and Public Affairs at Columbia. And I returned to campus, um, oh gosh, uh, after many, many years uh, to launch the Obama Foundation Scholars Program, which is housed at Columbia World Projects. And it's been um, an honor and a privilege uh, to be back on campus to be a part of this initiative, which um, provides outstanding rising leaders from around the world with opportunities to strengthen their capacity to lead and to accelerate the impact of their work. Um, I want to extend a very special welcome to our panelists who are current participants in the Obama Scholars Program, um, Francesco Tena from the United States and Patience Musiwa Makadawiri. Um, I'm very excited to have you all meet and hear from them today um, as we discuss the importance of resiliency and what, what it means for effective leadership. So, um, you know, while resiliency is a, a, a vital characteristic for any leader to possess, the challenge um, of navigating our personal and our professional lives during this current global health crisis has really tested all of us. And as we think of the existing challenges that the COVID-19 pandemic has accentuated and also accelerated, including uh, the deep uh, divisions and inequities that exist um, around the world, Resilient leadership is um, needed now more than ever. As innovative leaders who are addressing critical challenges in their communities and countries, I, I really look forward to having uh, the panelists share their perspectives on why leaders need to embrace resiliency. So Patience is the founder and executive director of Font for Nations, a nonprofit that aims to improve the educational access and economic mobility for all children in Malawi by creating learning and development spaces for differently abled children. And then our second panelist, Francesco, who's from the US, is the founder of Pipeline to Power, where he is working to develop meaningful civic engagement habits in young people, ensuring that they have the access and knowledge to remain active and inform residents for life. Um, as part of uh, this work, he's trained uh, hundreds of young people to be leaders in participatory budgeting processes and governmental decision-making across United States and Canada. Um, so before we be begin our conversation, I'm, I'm just gonna ask um, uh, quickly if viewers can remain muted during the panel discussion. Um, there'll be a dedicated time for uh, questions at the end of the moderated conversation. So please think about your questions um, that you'd like to ask the panelists and have those ready for the Q&A portion of the program. Um, please use the raise hand function in Zoom. If you have a question, you can also put a question um, in the chat. So um, with that, um, let's begin. So I, I wanna start by asking our panelists if you could each reflect on your own leadership and how it's evolved over the years and what are the one or two lessons learned that are now a, par a part of uh, how you lead and, and how um, have they served you? Um, Uh, patience, why don't we start with you? Thank you, Lisa. Um, wow, if I, if I, there, there are a couple of things, but I think that the thing that um, stands out the most is uh, being patient with, with the process. Um, I, I, surprisingly, I'm a very impatient person and I, I like to, I like things to happen um, as quickly as possible but one of the things that I think has really really helped me is um, first of all knowing that change takes time and change is a process and not an event um, I think that has really really helped me and then also um, the second thing I would say is just focusing on my support system um, because for the first couple of years it, it was really just you know wanting to do wanting to do and then you stop and realize that there are other people who care about the work just as much as you do. 
and relying on them to be my source of energy has really helped my leadership journey. Um, and so I'm talking about family. I'm talking about um, the people who believed in my work from day one, uh, who have been a constant support and just leaning on them in those moments of frustration has really um, helped me get to where I am today. So, yeah. Great, thank you. Francesco. Thank you, Lisa, for, for the question. And thank you all for, for making time and, and choosing to be here today. Um, as I think about my leadership journey, it probably the first time I thought of myself as a leader was when I was doing martial arts as a young person. Uh, I grew up in Boston, Massachusetts, and I would go to this community center and a youth service officer uh, would teach a bunch of young people karate. And I think for me at that point, what I felt leadership was, was being the person at the front of the room saying, 10 jumping jacks, everybody let's go. Or saying, hey, you messed that caught up, do, do 20 push-ups," And using my energy to bring people with me together. And I think, you know, it was a nice stepping stone at the time. Since then, I've, I've had a career and have been to a few organizations. And, and I think, um, at one point, I thought leadership was defined as moving people at a pace that they can tolerate. Mm. And even though it's not perfect, it's, it's better. And you, but you're still the person. It's become an action now. And I see leadership as an action. And it's something you exercise when you know something has to happen. But you also realize that the relationships you have with people are just as valuable. And if you try to move too quickly, you lose people. And so at, at that point, I was like, OK, so leadership is this action you exercise it, it's not a person, anyone can exercise leadership, there's authority, and then there's informal authority, and, and how we operate when our leadership is, is in that space. But I think even more than that, and, and this is very recently, um, that still led me to a place where I was trying to do almost everything. And I said, I wanna exercise leadership as much as I can. And this is what I can do for youth engagement, and this is what I do for governments and democracy, and this is what I can do for civic technology. And it's overwhelming. And, and, and I think we'll touch upon this later enough, but it's, it's actually at a point you exhaust yourself of practicing leadership. And for me right now, where I'm at is leadership is knowing when to rest. Leadership is giving people little to do. Um, leadership is more about consent than it is about pushing people. And I think that's where I currently am in my leadership journey. Thank you for that. And I, I just wanted to touch on something that you, you mentioned patience about um, the importance of a support system. And I'm wondering if um, maybe Francesca, if you could talk a little bit of, about what that means for you and patience, if you maybe wanted to just maybe elaborate a little bit about um, how that support system has, has, has helped you, guided you, and um, continues to be sort of a source of, of strength, um, uh, particularly now during this time. Um, sure, yeah. So I remember I, I, I started <laughs> uh, my work, I think when I, was, when I was 15, I was just volunteering. And then in 2014, I, um, I was part of a, of a camp that supported children um, who had just found out that they have HIV. And there I met the most uh, amazing person in the world. And he asked me like, what do you wanna do after? Cause I had just graduated, what do you wanna do? And I sort of explained and he says, wow, that's a big dream. You can't do it alone, you know? And if you need any help, I'm here. Um, that friend of mine went on to be co-founder, husband, best friend, and like his support has been um, completely like, you know, unshaking and moving. And he's helped me go through like a lot of a lot of frustrations, a lot of losses during my work. You know, like losing a program um, at the hospital or you know, losing opportunities for funding, like, you know, the whole thing, he has been there um, coming here. Uh, he's been the one pushing and saying, you can do it. Um, this is a great opportunity. When I am lost in this big city, he says, you know, you can do it. And so I think one of my biggest support has been my husband from 
that time when he says your dream is big, I can help you. And then also along the way, he's sort of like um, opened up my mind to, you know, to know that I can't, like Francesca said, I can't really do this on my own. I can't lead alone, you know, and part of, uh, part of my work has been to raise up leaders, even within found formations, within the community by delegating a lot. Uh, and so from there, kind of like was introduced to um, other older, um, mature people um, who, who, you know, helped me like frame what is it to run an organization? You know, I think of Maria, who is part of our board and has been like constantly working on, on, on me as, as an individual, as opposed to just my organization. I think of Helen Roldy now, who's the chair of our board. I think of Nohara, who is now leading the organization while I'm away. Uh, you know, just all these people that have come up in my life, um, be, you know, because of that idea that I can't do everything on my own. Um, and so, yeah, I'm, I'm truly grateful for the partnerships that I've built. You know, I think of Willie, who runs the teacher development organization, but we've sort of like been working together. Every, you know, project that comes up, you know, we're like, Willie, are you doing this? I'm doing this too. And uh, it's been great to grow the organization, to grow me as a leader um, and, and to just amplify our work you know, and not just focus on the few communities that we serve, but now shifting to like even largely advocating for all the children uh, that are differently able in Malawi. So, yeah. Th thank you for that. It's just, I, I think um, just important to remember that we, we don't do it alone, right? And the importance of yeah. having a community of, of individuals that are around you that are supportive of that big dream that you have, right? And can shore you mm -hmm. up. Um, when times get difficult. And Francesca, I don't know if you wanted to add um, anything to that before, before I move on to my next question. Okay. Um, and, they'll, they, and as I look at some of the other questions I have, I, I think we'll, we'll continue to, to kind of touch on that, um, that idea. Um, so, you know, when you, when you think of about um, personal resiliency, right, it's, it's this ability to adapt, to bounce back from adversity or difficult uh, experiences or disruptive changes. And um, in the face of this prolonged um, current global health crises that we are um, you know, all experiencing, um, what are some practices that have helped you to um, have the energy and the optimism to continue to move forward in positive, productive ways um, to achieve your, both your personal, um, but as well as your professional aspirations? Um, Francesco, let's start with I you. I can take this one first. Yes, please. Yeah, you know, this is this is a little bit of a deeper dive for, for me. I think um, one of the critiques I have of, of a resilience conversation or of a conversation resilience is that the idea of a personal resilience even exists. And if, if resilience, I mean, in preparation, I also looked it up, right? It's the ability of like a material to bounce back to its original shape. But I think that doesn't really translate to people because the intrinsic ability, or if we think of it as an intrinsic quality of someone, then the onus of your resilience seems to fall only on your shoulders. And the resilience is, is really a little more complicated than that. They're not, it's not that there are things you can do to increase your resilience, but I, I just, the, the reframe for me is how do I protect what resilience I have? Um, and how do I also make sure that the resilience of folks in my close networks, I'm not overburdening their resilience as well. Um, but but to, to answer your question more directly, like what are some practices? It looks like saying, saying no to things. Um, saying no to a lot of things. And there are always going to be a lot of issues in the world. And the best thing you can do is, is give yourself very little to focus on, give yourself very little to do. Um, we talk about the racial inequities of, of stress and how Black, Indigenous, people of color carry this allostatic load already, at least in the United States. Um, this pandemic compounds that. And for all the folks at Columbia who took math classes, compounding something as a multiplier, it's not an adder. 
You don't add stress together, they multiply each other, especially if they're happening at the same time. And so I would like the things I do is like seek help proactively. Um, I think when we talk about mental health, you know, the, we've, we've certainly rounded the corner in the US in terms of destigmatizing mental health or destigmatizing uh, mental health, certainly in the past 20 years. And we're, we still have a long way to go. It's, it's evident when there's a tragedy at a school. And if it was a physical tragedy, paramedics are on site, doctors are on site, they're treating people without question. However, when there is a tragedy and maybe folks weren't physically affected, but certainly mental, mentally affected, the line I, I always hear in the news is grief counselors are available for folks who need help, but everybody needs help when something happens that close to them. And so what there is something I think that we can all do, which is love ourselves better. Um, and that means like making sure mental health is, is prioritized. That's something I've been able to do um, during this pandemic proactively, luckily. Um, and, and also just, I think the other big practice piece is, is giving myself very little to do. Um, what I've recently started doing is if I find myself in an overwhelmed state, if I find myself losing the resilience um, and needing to protect it, I make a to-do list every day and the to-do list gets split up into three columns. What's required, what is preferred, and what's tradition. And I make sure Eating breakfast is required, eating lunch is required, drinking water between every task is required. Um, some things that are important but not required for the day go into the preferred column and you gotta be really planned um, because there are things you should do every day, but is it required? You can't really put too much on your plate. And then there are things that I put intentionally on my tradition. Tradition means things I may think I need to do, but I, do I really need to do them? It's like consume social media. The other day, I literally put think too much in the traditional column because even your, your headspace at this point is, you know, thanks to our, our capitalist society, our, our attention is for sale. And so making sure that you protect that space as well. Just some things I've been doing in the past um, few months to protect my resilience. Thank you for that, Francesco. And I, I, I'm going to reframe just a little bit when you talked about doing uh, very little, um, because I want to honor and, and recognize the, the enormous amount of incredible hard work <laughs> that you have um, engaged in over the years and continue to do. Um, and, and, but what I'm hearing from you is um, to be focused, right? And to be laser focused on what it is that is important to you, what you actually need to do to advance um, the work that you're engaged in or whatever project initiative, et cetera, that you might be engaged in and, and, um, and, and saying no when you, when you need to, right? Not, not having, uh, you know, other things yeah. sort of pull you, pull you away um, if, if it's not really helping you um, at the moment, advance what's in front of you. You're, you're totally right, Lisa. And I think maybe a little more nuanced way, uh, if, if, if I would reframe it is um, give attention to what's important. Um, because when you do things that are important and when you do things that are critical, I work with young people. It's, I can't work with young people in an urgent manner because then things become unsafe for them. I can't underthink how we're going to train them. I can't underthink the supports we need for them. And if I, if I take on too much, then, then things that become required don't, don't happen because I've, I've, I've put too much on my plate. But thanks, so thank you for the, the, the Thank refine. you. Um, patience, um, what are, you know, what, what are uh, practices? And I think you touched on a, on, on a couple of yeah. things that um, support you and help you yeah. as you move through the world. But mm -hmm. are there specific practices that um, you've engaged in um, to help you maintain your energy and remain optimistic in the face of you know, the challenging work that, that you're engaged in. Yeah, I think, um, I think back to the time when um, COVID first hit, hit, hit Malawi and we had to 
uh, closed vaccination for like two weeks because we didn't know what to do. And we're like, all our engagement has been in person. Now the government put restrictions on in-person gatherings, like our trainings and our workshops with, with, the, with the parents, our counseling sessions. Um, and so I think uh, part of it is just room to think and, and brainstorm. Um, and so we did, we did take that break. It was, nobody knew what it was for because it was like in the middle of the year, but we're like, let's all take a break. Let's all figure out. And there was a lot of fear around, uh, are we going to get it? Are we going to die? And so I was like, you know, let, let everyone take, take a break, go think about it, be with family and think about whether you want to uh, work during this time as well. Uh, but what that did for us is uh, it helped us strategize. It helped us um, think about the future of our nations and what helped us focus our thoughts were our beneficiaries and i'll say that uh at least for for my work which seeps a lot into my personal life is just thinking about the people we serve really really drives me like um you know thinking about that child who came in couldn't hold a pencil um, couldn't you know now he he smiled every time you give him a task is just it's really really um, motivating for me and so that's the first thing we did we're like if we were to shut down what would that mean for our beneficiaries what would that mean for those children who um you know for example government was like oh radio programming to continue learning but some of these kids can't hear um, some of these kids can process as fast. And so we're like, what will happen if we, you know, if we close? And so we ended up, you know, having to think about ways. Um, and the other important thing is ask them, right? And I think that I also draw strength in their strength, right? Um, asking the mom, are you guys okay coming back for our sessions? Are you guys okay doing anything? And hearing from them, that yeah we need this we need we 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 need to be with each other now malawi is a very special place it's called the warm heart of africa and so like our biggest deal with with COVID was not being able to to hug each other to greet each other to um just be close and that was the biggest you know struggle and i think that listening to them also sort of like helped us uh build that for me personal, but then also as a collective, that resilience to say, you know, we can do this, we can push through this together um, and hearing from them. And that could sort of like motivated us to say, oh, we can do, we can go on. Uh, and so, yeah, I think that space to think. Um, and then, like you said, Francesco prioritizing, um, I do moments of deep work where I'm like, off distractions, off my phone, off emails, off whatever, because I really want to either focus, think, or, um, you know, get things done. Uh, and then I also sort of like, you know, prioritize to what mean, what is important, what is urgent, you know, what can be done now, what can I delegate, what can I just remove from my list? Um, so yeah, all those, you know, all those practices. I eat my frog first. <laughs> I learned this from Brian Tracy to always, you know, get the toughest thing out of the way. And that has helped. So I think it's a combination of a lot of things. But like, if I were to, you know, pinpoint a motivation, I would say that's our community, our beneficiaries, my staff, who are, I sometimes who are my beneficiaries as well. Um, and just making sure that they're okay with continuing, um, yeah. Um, thank, thank you for that. And I, I think that's a, a, a great segue into my next question. And that is, you know, from an organizational perspective, how have you had to pivot or shift your approach to your work in order to adapt to the current circumstances and to, and to continue to meet the needs of the communities um, that you care about and that you, that you serve, um, particularly right now during this um, global health crisis? Yeah, um, I could just jump right into yeah, that. Um, yeah, so what we what we have done, like I said, everything was in person, and we had to start coming up with options of um, remote solutions, and uh, also thinking about like what technologies is available in Malawi because it's not just you know the issue of like the tech, the hardware, but it's also the issue of like the infrastructure, the 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 bandwidth, the network. Like, so if we were to have things like online, do people have access to the internet and things like that? And also just the usability of it. 
Um, and so one simple thing we thought was, what about phone calls? Um, um, the number of people with, with um, phones in Malawi has you know, risen exponentially. And so we used phone calls for our um, counseling sessions. Uh, we'll call parents uh, from our database or ask them to call back. So we had like a call back option. Um, for our students, our learners, what we did was we placed volunteers um, in different school zones and they would work with the teachers to come up like, with what the kids needed to do that week. And then they would call the parents and work with them. So obviously there was a lot of assumptions, one that the parents are available and then two that the parents are willing to teach the kids. Um, and so we're still sort of like refining that. And, Part of the big motivation for coming here or even applying for the Obama College program was for me to sort of like learn how to transition our um, methodologies or deliveries um, to more online and more remote options and solutions. And so I'm really excited, some of the classes I'm taking and the opportunities here at Columbia and really grateful. Um, but a lot of our thinking and framing has now been shifting from uh, in person to remote, just in case this becomes like prolonged or just in case something else happens and, and we can't. And that realization sort of like shifted our strategy in a big way because now we're like, we only like so far, I mean, we've supported about 10 to 12,000 children and their families, but there are 200,000 children that are reported to be in school with special needs. And now our question was, how do we reach them too? you know, without compromising the, the, the depth of our programming, but how do we reach them? And, and so we're trying to, we've now shifted our focus from um, just service delivery to an integrated service uh, model where we are wanting to put like applied research and science, um, combine that with uh, content for teachers and content for parents and content for communities, and then inform a community of practice you know, like the vision right now is to become um, a thought leader on inclusive education in Africa. And I think that part of that um, is, you know, what I'm learning here. And then what we're also learning um, from our beneficiaries and, and our communities in terms of how do we sort of like scale our work without compromising on the depth of our work, which is individualized and personalized learning. Um, and so, yeah, that's sort of like um, the, 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 the shift and Columbia came at the, you know, the Obama School program came at the perfect time because it's helping me rethink um, and just have brainstorming sessions, conversations with people that will be really interesting to, you know, move our vision forward. Thank you for that patience. And um, mm -hmm. Francesco, I've, I've heard you talk a little bit about how you've leveraged technology um, during this time uh, to continue your work. If you could talk a little bit about um, how you're doing that now or how you have been doing it during this challenging time. Yeah, I think I'd like to talk about what <clears throat> the shift has looked like on, on three different levels. And the first is a programmatic level. And before the pandemic, I ran a youth program, excuse me, I may have to burp in the next few seconds. <clears throat> so apologies for that in advance. But um, <laughs> I, I ran a, and it's gone away now that I've named it. Good, thank you. Um, <laughs> I ran a youth program that trained young people in cities on participatory budgeting, on leadership, on how their city government worked, and on some basic employability skills. It was a 75 hour institute that took place over three weeks. Um, it was in person every day. Uh, well, Monday through Friday, we provided lunch. Oh, actually, no, we did not provide lunch. <laughs> Sorry. Um, special events, we provided lunch. But we paid young people $15 an hour. And they were with us from 10 to about 4 o'clock, Monday through Friday. After that, during the school year, they would work in service of the city they worked in, either the civic engagement agency of the city and support youth engagement generally. When the pandemic hit, in March, we had to make a decision about the summer. And I was like, we, I, don't, I don't know what remote learning looks like. I can't deliver 75 hours. Imagine a young person staring at a screen for 75 hours over the course of, of three weeks. That, that learning can't be good. Or maybe it could be, but I don't know how to do that. Um, so 
what we did is we ended up extending the same cohort that we had already recruited. We said, hey, if y'all like this, we've got this really cool, we can just continue the practice. Um, but again, let's give them a little to do. We decreased the hours from 25 hours a week over three weeks to 10 hours a week over six weeks, right? You're able to spread out um, some of the work, which I think is, is, a, is a method of resilience spreading out what could be stressful over time. Time is, is great to do that. Um, and instead of working 20 hours a month, let's, let's notch that down during the school year as well, because I don't know what the school year is gonna look like, but I wanna make it as easy for our young people to be flexible as possible. And so that really is something that we root ourselves in in what the tech world calls user-centered design. If a young person is late, I don't penalize folks. I take that as feedback. What could I do better to accommodate folks who may be in a situation where they can't arrive on time? And so the reframe of who bears the burden of, of, of this is, is, I think, really radical from a programmatic level. From a, or from a like, <clears throat> one step above that administrative level, I ask for more money from contracts um, because I know it's, it's going to take a lot of work and I give myself realistic timelines. Um, that is like super important from a programmatic level for the staff that I work with who are keeping this program together. I'm, I'm not gonna, if, if you're not asking for the, appropriate amount of, for the appropriate amount of money and you're asking someone to do something for free and it's usually not up on the power chain, it's usually down on the power chain. And that leads to theft of resilience for those folks. And then at an even higher level, I think one thing that the pandemic has really forced is like, what, what does a resilient business model look like? Is this the right work that I'm doing? What does it look like to share power in my community of practice of the folks who are around the world are doing that? I'm in Barcelona right now trying to figure that out. Um, some of the technology I use is an open source product that's built in Barcelona. So I'm like, let me, I, I can't do this alone. I've got to come and build relationships with folks who are running into the same issues I am. I've got to make sure that the sustainability of it, the business models, reinforce that collaboration as well. So I think there are lessons here at the very programmatic level, at the organizational level, and just also just at the, the practice level as well. Uh, thank you both for, for your comments. And I think what I'm, I'm struck by is how um, this collaborative participatory approach that you all take where um, you are um, you know, like actually engaging in a conversation with the people who are the beneficiaries of, of the work. And I think that's, I think too often that doesn't happen and we make assumptions about what we think people need, um, but, but not getting the kind of input that can actually inform how you, how you do the work. So I, I appreciate your comments. So last question before we move into Q and A, um, as you think about the capacities that you want to develop during your time here at Columbia um, and during your participation in the Obama Scholars Program, what do you, what do you hope your leadership will look like um, when you uh, return turn to your work? Um, Francesco, do you want to continue here? Yeah, I can try. I, I haven't. I've, I've been staring at this question for the past few days, and I've been trying to figure out what the answer is. Um, so I can, I can give you the latest version, <laughs> which is still a And it may change, and it may change. And, it, so and at, I hope at it this does moment, change. What do, you, what do you think it, what are you thinking about? Um, it's, it's actually, it, it, it has to do with the reframe I mentioned earlier of, I'm in a position of authority. I'm in a position of power. I'm the head of my organization. I'm the decider on contract. If I look around the room, if, if these are alumni of Columbia University, I have to imagine these are folks who may be managerial, who may be executives in their spaces that they occupy as well. And so for me, the, the lessons I'm trying to lead with are what can I do so that I'm not someone who's using power to exercise authority, to exercise influence over folks who have less power than me. Um, so that I'm not stealing folks' resilience, right? I think about now resilience as a currency that folks have. 
And every time that I try to circumvent a consensual way to make decisions using power or authority, then that's making my node on this network of resilience stronger and stealing from the node of someone else's resilience a little weaker. And to think about resilience as a network, and we think of just the, the same way we, we have the ability to, to, to reform, our resilience is based on the, the network of the resilience of those around me. And if I'm hoarding resilience from folks around me, then I'm, I'm, I'm good. And I'm wondering why ever, no one else, why can't anyone else take a stand? Why can't anybody else say no? Like it's, 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 so that's what I'm trying to do with my leadership. I wanna understand, you know, what are the practices? What are the methods? What are the business models? What are, who are the people who this work? Who are the people who are maybe abusing um, their authority over folks? And how can I best invest in the resilience of me and my, and the networks around me? I think that's really kind of what I'm, I'm trying to figure out. Um, so that one requires me to identify who's, who's in my community of practice and also how I can share as much power as possible. Thank you for that. And um, patience, um, do you wanna talk a little bit about, at least, at least at this moment, you know, what do you hope your leadership will look like um, at the end of your, your time here at Columbia? Um, so first thing I have to say is that uh, it's sort of like brought back, you know, hope. Um, going back to what I was saying about how our communities have um, sort of like surprised us in how they've decided to go on with us um, and just realizing that um, they're capable, right? Which is, which is uh, crazy that the pandemic helped us realize those things, that our communities are capable of doing things that we're not or ordinarily um, um, seen as they could be able to do it. For example, like teach their own children, right? Um, be involved in their children's education. For us, it's, you know, uh, we have always said, oh, Malawi is technologically backwards, but just seeing remote learning work, and I think for me, it's now becoming more more aware um, of, of of the role I have in advocacy. I think is is the biggest thing I'm taking away. One of the biggest thing I'm taking away is um, you know I'll consider myself an an implementer, right? Like I'm I'm the one who wants to do things, or um, and like I said, shifting from service delivery, um, shifting from um, um, looking at others to be the one to advocate, um, you know, like, for example, right now, there's a, uh, Malawi is starting to develop an inclusive education policy. Before this, before coming here, I'll probably be like, okay, sure, you know, some, somebody else will advocate for that, and it helps us do our work better, but now I'm thinking I should be in the forefront uh, personally, but also found foundations should be in the forefront of being a resource of, of helping us um, co-design this policy, bringing in our community voices. So it's, for me, it's thinking, you know, more broadly, um, leveraging the networks that I have here, or, um, that I'm forming here to, um, to you know, impact in, in a big way. It's also seeing scale differently. Um, it, 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 um, and one thing that I, I am so appreciative of the program is um, you guys pushing us to focus on value-based leadership. Um, I hadn't seen that, but like I started noticing in, in how you, so for example, <laughs> coming here, things are a bit self-directed, right? You keep telling us this can be whatever you want it to be. If you guys want to rest, rest. If you want to, you know, like work, work. And I was like, what are they doing? You know, shouldn't it be like, um, but the value I'm starting to get is, is that you are actually focusing on us as individual leaders and not really um, focusing on our thematic areas or organizations, which is important, but I think you're building our uh, uh, individual capacity so that when we go back, we could be whatever um, that is even outside of, of the organizations, for example. And shout out to Ana Marie Gonzalez, who like, is a 2019 scholar who made me realize some of this, that when, when I go back, I could continue to lead Found for Nations, um, I could completely go into policy and advocacy. I could, there's a lot of things that I could do. And I think the value is that broadened mindset 
that broadened way of thinking around the, you know, the place that our community holds um, and the place that I hold, like Francesco said, as a leader um, and, and as a person in authority and, and how I can use that to um, make a difference, um, a long lasting difference in Malawi, whatever that will look like when I return. So yeah, thank you so much for the opportunity. Well, thank you, uh, Patience. And um, someone had asked a question uh, about the Obama Scholars Program. So before we end, I will, I'll give a, a sort of a brief overview uh, of the program, but um, let's now turn to uh, questions from our viewers. And um, again, you can use the, please use the raise hand function in Zoom, but you can also submit a question um, in the chat. Okay, let's see. Um, I'm going to one of the questions here. Well, I actually see someone on the screen and then I'll go to the chat. Um, is it Peter Olo? Yeah, hi. Um, hi. I'm, I'm in Northern New Jersey. Um, thank you so much, um, Patience and Francesco for your openness and sharing. And I have to tell you, I'm a psychiatrist and a hospital administrator, and I really credit your generation with lifting stigma on helping folks to access you know, needed mental health care. So thank you very much for that and, and mentioning that today. Um, right now in our industry, we're facing a lot of difficulty with people uh, leaving the industry for a variety of reasons. This is not just in healthcare, but in many industries, people have been leaving the workforce. And I just want to pick your um, young, fresh, very bright brains and <laughs> see what thoughts you might have on strategies for keeping people you know, for retaining people and keeping people engaged and not leaving the workforce at a time when there's so much needed. Any thoughts you have? Thank you, Peter. Mm -hmm. Francesco, patience. Um, Fran Francesco thought? looks ready to take that. <laughs> what? I'm just smiling. It's a good question. <laughs> um, yeah, I think um, ask like what, ask folks what, it, what is pushing them to leave, have really honest conversations with folks. Um, I, I, I'm sure that there are different reasons for different people, for different industries. And I'm also sure that if you follow the money and the power, then there are some things that as a society we can do better. Um, one of the things that this pandemic laid pretty bare is that there is literally not even a global pandemic will prevent capitalism from extracting as much labor possible from people. And if you're young and you're an intern and you're an unpaid intern, or if you're paid little, but you're like, you know, I'm really passionate about this. You'd like to think that there's someone on the other side who's looking for you just as much. And in the past year and a half, we've seen that that's not true in a lot of cases. Um, so my, inevitably, if you ask me a question, it's going to lead to participatory budgeting. Um, but it, but it's the theme of sharing power, right? What power do those folks who are leaving have over what work they can take on? Were they overworked? How did, how was work put onto them? And I think we, as we move towards a more of a healing process, I turn to things like sociocracy as ways to organize. Um, I, I turn to things that are just, we, there, there needs to be something that's not a hierarchical structure. That's not our typical hierarchical structure that I think we're used to um, working in where decisions get made at the top and then the, the, the burden gets passed down until the last person's carrying it. And so I think, the, but, but again, this is that, is, that is laden with assumptions. The first thing you need to do is ask. Um, so many times I've quit a job and, and I've never had an exit interview. I'm like, all right, y'all don't wanna know, fine. Um, but step one is ask. And, and I think you can never go wrong with sharing power. Yeah. I think I just wanna add on that. And I think that um, uh, apart from asking the questions, but what we're noticing is also people are no longer um, at least one of uh, uh, my realizations here is that people are no longer um, 
living for one another, right? Like um, it's no longer a value that many uphold. Um, and I think we need to sort of like in inculcate that in our education system, like motivation to stay in the workforce starts with you understanding that your work is valuable and that there's a need. Um, that, that people need you and that behind that need, there are people who are as valuable as you are. I think um, it's great to think about ourselves and to have self-care and to think about our state, but I feel like what that is doing, it's pushing away from the you know, others. It's, we're now thinking of ourselves too much at the, at the expense of the others who might you know, need our service or need our help. And so I think um, is, is um, yeah, like valuing others as, as much as we value ourselves and valuing our work. Um, and, I, and I think that that is, is partly individual, but also partly like how, what can companies do to make their employees feel valued? What can companies do to make employees feel like their work matters, that if they don't show up, you know, things won't get done? Um, because I think that uh, that will sort of like motivate um, people to stay. Those are all, all great points. Um, I'm going to the chat now and uh, have a question about um, how you're using your time here at Columbia as an Obama scholar. So maybe if you could talk a little bit about classes, workshops, um, you touched on a little bit on how you're thinking about your time here, you know, the patients you mentioned, giving yourself more space or having the space to do the kind of deep thinking that you want to be able mm -hmm. to do. So if you could talk a little bit about, about your time here, knowing that um, we're still a bit early in, in the year, but um, over to you too. Uh, Patience, do you wanna kick us off here? Yeah, yeah, um, so what, I'm, what am I doing? Uh, we have uh, workshops, uh, Mondays and Fridays, class, Tuesdays and Wednesdays, and, and then think time on Thursdays, for me at least. Um, and then reaching out to more um, community around. Uh, so my classes right now are focused on policy and advocacy, which I love, and how I'm now able to make the connection between my work back home. Like the first two weeks, I was like, what is this? Like, why? <laughs> why? But none of this makes sense, but I think that um, just being patient, <laughs> being patient I'm now realizing that there's a lot I've been learning from that and then the workshops are really uh, about you know uh, public narrative which has been talking about our stories which is something that for me you know I've never really done um, and so that sort of like stretched me a bit um, and then um, uh, you know introduction to the design studio so there's a lot and now we have um, coaches uh, working, starting work with our executive coaches, which is supposed to help us um, come up with an action plan for the time that we're here, meeting faculty advisor um, that is, you know, helping make the connections with other Columbia professors. Um, so it's, it's a really robust program and it's, it's just the beginning, um, which makes it uh, a little like uh, at my own pace. Uh, but I have a feeling that it's going to get intense very quickly. Um, but right now it's been really slow. Adjusting to the city, oh my God, like just finding out what milk you want to buy or how to use the laundry app or um, Subway. Uh, so with that and then figuring out classes and the workshops, I think it's, um, it's, it's just been a great experience overall. And I'm really excited for the next half of the semester and, and even the next semester. <laughs> Thank you. Francesco, do you want to briefly talk a little bit about um, your time? Sure. Um, the classes I'm taking are public spaces and human rights or urban public spaces and human rights and in this peoples in Meso Mesoamerica. Um, and I think one of the themes that I'm, I'm seeing emerge in this program is finding, I guess what we call community, I think, one of the first questions that we were asked was, what is home to you? And my reply at that time was, you know, home is wherever the expectations of me are just for me to be myself. And if I'm surrounded by people who have no expectations other than that, I'm home. And I'm meeting more and more people through this program who make me feel that way, who, who don't, who just are happy to meet me or like aren't, aren't trying to like, 
you know, it's not a transactional relationship. Um, so much, so much love and support from the program where when I, now when I describe to people what the program is, I'm like, I think this is just people that really want me to succeed. And, and it really feels that way. And so um, my, my, my fellow scholars, patients, you know, we were uh, patients, Millicent, Nika and I, you know, three weeks ago now, I think we're at this design, at the design studio. I'm sure I'm messing the name of that place up. Um, <laughs> design lab. And and what we did in those, I don't know, hour and a half has, has been, you know, a, a leapfrog for me and my understanding of what I do, my understanding of what patience does, and my understanding of what is the connective tissue between the seemingly disparate work. What is the thing that we're both actually trying to accomplish? Um, and so meeting professors, Lisa, you've been so great at connecting me to people that you think will, will support or that will be like, um, mutually beneficial to meet uh, the Columbia World Projects. Um, I'm, I'm chomping at the bit. I can't wait to see what's coming down, um, what's coming down that flow for for us to work on. And so those are some of the things I've been I've been up to. Great. Thank thank you both. Um, and we are uh, beyond excited to have the two of you and the ten other scholars that are also participating in the program this year. Um, let's see, I'm just doing a time check. I think we have maybe time for um, one or two more questions. I have a question in the chat here. Um, when people are reluctant to follow your lead, what tactics do you use to drive, um, I think it's to drive them to your vision or to bring them on board with your vision? Um, Sorry, could you ask that again? Yes, um, so when people are, maybe reluctant to follow your lead, to, to, to sort of move with you um, in, in your work? Um, what tactics you use to drive, um, to, to help them see your vision, um, be on board with what you're proposing um, and to move forward with you if they're expressing some reluctance or ambivalence to do that? Um, yeah, so for me, I, I'm a questions person. So the first, my first instinct would be to ask, uh, first of all, to get a little bit more understanding as to, you know, why are they reluctant? Why are they, you know, what is holding them back and things like that. And um, the other is to sort of like, um, see from, for myself internally is to see the vision of not just my vision. And so to explain the vision as our vision, to explain the vision as this is our problem and this is how I think we can solve it as opposed to this is just, you know, my way of doing things, this is just my vision. And um, another thing is, and we have also learning this through the public narrative is uh, what are the shared values, right? Like what, what, what are the shared values with, with these people that could, help build the vision or that or how do they see themselves fit into the bigger picture I think a lot of the times people are not reluctant because they don't make that connection between like uh, what is this and what is my role in that and so uh, the bigger uh, at least for me for for casting my vision it's, it's a lot has a lot of work has gone into making them see themselves in that vision like what is it about them that they um, that they see in that vision. And, and I, I found that it really helped. Um, and people just, you know, just come. When you talk about the vision as a broad we, as a broad us, um, as opposed to my vision, I think it helps bring people on board much easier. But I'll start with asking why they're not there yet. Thank you for that. Um, Francesco, um, I, think you, I think you've probably touched a lot on, on this, question in many ways, but do you have anything to add? Um, yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, yeah, uh, two parts to that. I think um, when I was a, a teenager in City Hall, uh, both surrounded by adults that listen, but also being the only young person, I, I found myself just Googling like how to, how to work, what work culture is. And one of the things that I came across was Antoine de Saint-Exupéry, um, the author of The Little Prince, uh, with a quote that's, if you wanna build a ship, don't, I don't, I'm just paraphrasing. If you want to build a ship, don't divide people up to, to cut down trees or like do all these tasks. Instead, teach them to yearn for the vast and endless seas. 
And which I think is like what Paige talking about, is this a shared vision? And then second, if I feel I've done that and there's still reluctance, then it's two questions that I, I go through with folks. Is what I'm offering something that's safe to try? And is it good enough to try? And if folks feel that it's not, is it's not safe to try? Who thinks it's not safe? Um, and if it's not, then we don't do it. Um, we, we talk about it, is it safe to try or not? Or is it good enough to try? And if it's not, I don't do it. Thank you both. And I, I received a couple questions about the Obama Scholars Program. And I'm also mindful of the time and that there's a 10 a.m. session. And I'm sure there are viewers here who wanna be able to attend that. So I'll just give a really high level overview of the program and would encourage um, uh, anyone that's interested to learn more to go to Columbia World Projects website, which is where the Obama Scholars Program is housed and you can read more details. But the program was launched in 2018. It's a partnership between Columbia University and the Obama Foundation. And the goal is to uh, identify um, outstanding rising leaders from around the world um, who are doing um, innovative work in their communities and countries and regions to address critical challenges. And um, uh, we bring them to Columbia University's campus. It's an academic year long program and they participate in a slate of personal professional development workshops, um, uh, audited classes at Columbia. We pair them with a faculty advisor to help inform their thinking about their work. Um, there's also some Obama Foundation led workshops that um, uh, scholars participate in. We have a thought leadership series. And, and I would say that um, you know another important goal for us is for the scholars to uh, participate in the, the Columbia community, which is what um, Francesco and Patience um, are doing today as part of this panel conversation. Um, so uh, I think we're, we're at time. Um, unfortunately, these hours go by so quickly, but I just wanna thank the panelists for sharing your experiences, your perspectives and your wisdom. I always learn something new from you every time I speak to you and also uh, to the audience for your, for your terrific questions. And I also wanna thank the coordinators of the Columbia Alumni uh, Leadership Experience for organizing this event and the, and the broader conference. Um, so uh, there's a 10 o'clock session, um, 10 a.m. Eastern time on making the pivot, volunteerism and career development. So I'd encourage um, viewers to attend that um, if there is interest and you can join the session by using your experience link and navigating um, to the session. Um, so thank you, Patience San Francesco, and um, thank you uh, to our audience members um, for your terrific questions and joining the session today. So take care and enjoy, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.